we have a nice overcast day. It's a good day. I don't think it's going to be too hot today. And uh, it's just time to keep going. An attitude has been defined as having three component parts. Affect, cognition, and behavior. The adaptive component refers to an individual's evaluation of, liking for, or emotional response to a person, thing, or concept. The cognitive component comprises his beliefs or knowledge about that person, thing, or concept. The behavioral component covers the way he actually acts towards the person, thing, or as a result of holding the concept. As Zimbardo points out in Influencing Attitudes and Changing Behaviors, any deliberate attempts made to change people's attitudes have to work on all three elements. A technique that affects one's emotional beliefs but not one's actions is completely effective. A technique that affects one's emotional beliefs but not one's actions is completely effective. Oh, but not one's actions is not completely effective. This chapter will look in detail at a number of the discoveries that have been made about attitude change and methods of influencing behavior, but it will concentrate on those areas where the influence is a subtle one and its effects on a person unconscious. While fully acknowledging that television or direct political appeals have influencing powers, that more overt form of influence is not under discussion here. I'm trying to be straight my speech. <sighs> Obedience to authority. A person with inner conviction loathes stealing, killing, and assault may find himself performing these acts with relative ease when commanded by authority. Behavior that is unthinkable to an individual who is acting on his own may be executed without hesitation when carried out under orders. Facts of recent history and observation in daily life suggest that, for many people, obedience may be a deeply ingrained behavioral tendency. Indeed, the proponent impulse overriding training or indeed a proponent a pre yeah proponent a propotent a prepotent indeed a prepotent impulse overriding training or ethics sympathy and moral conduct professor stanley milgram wrote these words in the introduction to obedience to authority and published the account of an experiment which left shockwaves rippling throughout the world. Shockwaves. He had discovered that thinking man does not always make decisions in a rational way. In fact, sometimes totally incapable of it. Circumstances and deeply entrenched behavioral traits can radically affect right judgment. Harsh Milgram. Milgram's experiment involved 300,000 people in an attempt to find out whether punishment had advantageous effects on learning, which we discussed earlier is not just simply learning, but if, uh, uh, anyway, or that it was, or that what was <laughs> what? Or that was what the subjects were told. In fact, the real goal of the experiment was to find out about the behavior of the subjects themselves in a particularly stressful situation. Forty people took part in each experiment and each time volunteers were divided so that there would be 40% working class, 40% white collar, and 20% from professional classes. The age range from mid-20s to mid-40s. 
The first series of experiments was carried out at Yale University, where Milgram worked, and the volunteers were solicited through local papers in New Haven, an incentive being that they would receive a fee for taking part. Oh, they would receive the fee, not pay the fee. There you go. And make corrections. Each volunteer was paired with another person, supposedly another volunteer, but in reality a confederate of the, ex yeah, of the experimenter. The real volunteer was to act as a teacher and the confederate as learner. The teacher had to develop the learner in a long list of word pairs and then test his memory. If the learner got one wrong, he was to receive an electric shock, which the teacher would deliver by pressing a switch on the shock generator in front of him, to which the learner was wired in another room. The intensity of the shocks ranged from 15 to 450 volts, and there were 30 switches in all. Every ensuing time that the learner made a mistake, the shocks were to increase progressively by intensity or in intensity. The teachers were given a sample 45 volt shock before beginning, so that their belief that the generator was actually switched on would be assured. In fact, of course, the learner never received any shocks at all, but he always responded in the following way. Okay. At 75 volts, he would grunt in discomfort. At 120 volts, he would complain. At 150, if everyone got that far, or if anyone got that far, he would demand to be released from the experiment. At 285, he was to emit an agonized scream, whereafter nothing would be heard from him again. It would, or it was arranged among the experimenters that if a teacher turned to an experimenter for guidance as to whether it was the right thing to go on administering the shocks or not, the experimenter would be given four prods. Okay, we're going to have to look at that. We're close. Only progressing from one prod to the next if the first was unsuccessful. The prods were, please go on. The second was, the experiment requires that you continue. And the third one, it is absolutely essential that you continue. The fourth, you have no other choice. You must go on. If the subject was still resisting and objecting after the fourth prod, the experiment was to be terminated. If the teacher was still carrying on with the experiment after the point where the learner had lapsed into ominous silence, he was to be instructed he should seek guidance to wait five seconds for a response from the learner and, if none was forthcoming, to carry on giving on the shocks in the same way as if the learner had answered wrongly. Whoa, 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 this is new information to us. The teachers were all told that the shocks would be painful to the learner but wouldn't inflict any permanent damage. Okay, now let's also top, stop and have a little topic. Okay, hold on. This was new. If the teacher was still carrying on the experiment with the after the point where the learner lapsed into ominous silence at 285 volts, he was to be told should he seek the guidance. Should he seek the guidance, he should be told to wait five seconds for a response from the learner and, if none was forthcoming, to carry on giving the shocks the same way as if the learner answered wrong. Z -z 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 hello? Hello? Are you in there? Hey! Hey! Are you dead yet? Are you kidding me? Wow! Okay, we're, we're backing off to... The prods were, please go on. The experiment requires that you continue. It's absolutely essential that you continue. 
You have no other choice. You must go on. How far would you go? How far would you go? I mean, can you imagine yourself in that situation? You can think over it. You can play in your imagination about it. But then, Would you continue? I highly doubt that I would. I don't really care for authority, but suppose I genuinely believed in the experiment. Please go on. Okay, I'll dismiss my disbelief for a moment. Okay. The experiment requires that you go on. If I'm genuinely curious, if I'm, if I'm a scientist and whatnot, I don't know. I might, or I might not. It, it would be incredibly difficult, but depending on my mind state, I might think, okay, we'll see, right? It's absolutely essential. Hell no. Oh, fuck no. Oh, fuck no. You've seen enough. This, this, this is your data. Thank you very much. I'm out. Is how I would most likely be. <laughs> and it's probably just the use of the adjectives. You know, I, I would never get to number four. In fact, I would probably, at the number two prompt, would be when I would be seeking guidance. You know. He doesn't have to be in an ominous silence. He has to be... He's... he's, he's where, where were we? Oh. Demanding to let go? Probably. <laughs> I don't know how far I go. I mean, the complaints, depending on the... Because I'm not going to go from 120 to 150. So, I'll be like incremental with it. Therefore, his complaints are going to become incremental, at some point I'm going to realize this is not an effective treatment to to study learning, because he's now too focused on whether or not he's going to get hurt again, when how much it hurts, and how discomfort, you know, so of course he's not going to learn that state of mind, duh. So yeah, I'd probably make it to level two. <laughs> oh shit, this ruined your whole I don't know, just feel yourself out. <sighs> That's my opinion. Just the psychology scares me <laughs> because it, to think that 65% of the people and even though I gave you my opinion, it's the same opinion that every intelligent person would think. So how did these people do this? But they were trying to study what they, you know, they did it anyway, because what they were trying to study was people's stressful reactions in the face of authority and to prove most of us have no resistance against authority. And remember, this is this is a callback to a couple of chapters ago. Before the experiment started, psychiatrists were asked to predict how the teachers would react to the giving of painful electric shocks to a person to whom they could wish no harm, albeit in the interest of science. Psychiatrists confidently predicted that none but the lunatic fringe would go beyond 150 volts. Their assumption being that people, for the most part, were decent and don't willingly inflict hurt, were patently, un were patently undeserved, and that a person makes his own decisions about what he sees as right and wrong and acts on them 
regardless of what he is told to do. But the predictions, however, were disastrously inaccurate. They focused on the individual as an autonomous unit, rather than the individual as somewhat affected by the nature of the situation he finds himself in. Over all the experiments, it was average for 25 out of 40 people to carry on to the end. Administering 450 volt shocks to their innocent partner. Protect your mind. My grandchild, my daughter, my son, my grandson. I haven't got one of those yet, so he's on I put him. Protect your mind. During the experiments, the teachers who obeyed instructions and carried on with the shocks quite clearly suffered distress, according to Milgram. Tension, sweating, and trembling were pronounced. Quote, during the experiments, the teachers who obeyed the instructions and carried them out clearly suffered distress. They were tense, they were sweating, they were trembling. All these things were pronounced. Quite obviously, they were in conflict, yet they didn't do anything to bring themselves relief, and so end the tension, as in stop the experiment. Milgram commented, There must be a competing drive, tendency, or inhibition that, produce, that precludes activation of the obedient response. must be a competing drive, tendency or inhibition, which precludes activation of the disobedient response. During interviews after the experiment with, with the overwrought teachers, Milgram started to get some idea of why they had acted as they did and how they had personally tried to cope with what they were doing. Most couldn't believe that they had been incap that they had been capable of acting as they did. Milgram found that politeness, a wish to keep their promise to help the experimenter and embarrassment at backing out, all helped to prevent obedient subjects from taking any action to stop the experiment. He also made the following points to further explain their behavior. Adjustments started to take place in the subject's thinking, which served to undermine his resolve to break from authority, reduce the strain he was under, and help keep him up. Help keep up his relationship with the experimenter, for existence, or for instance. He would get immersed in the procedures of the experiment in order to lose sight of ethical issues. For instance, he would get immersed in the procedures of the experiment in order to lose sight of the ethical issues. And he would decide that he was not responsible for what happened. He was, after all, just an agent uh, of an ex external authority. And two, the subject didn't lose his moral character. Or, I'm sorry, damn. didn't lose his moral sense. It was just that the morality that was 
uppermost was the need to live up to the expectations of authority, to carry out what he had freely undertaken, or in short, to keep his word. The subject might start to attribute an impersonal quality to what was going on. The experiment became an entity in itself, with an impersonal momentum of, his own, of its own. The experiment had got to go on. At the point the subject had lost sight of the fact that an experiment is the creation of that the that an experiment is the creation of a person. I'm making any sense. The subject might start to attribute an impersonal quality to what was going on. This experiment became a thing in itself, with its own momentum. It had to go on. At that point, the subject loses sight of the fact that an experiment is the creation of a human, and not this all-important thing. Okay. The subject will see his behavior as part of the honorable pursuit of scientific for scientific truth. This helped to justify it. And five, it was common for the subject to alter his perceptions of the learner in order to justify the pain that he had inflicted on him. The learner became unworthy, someone who was so stupid he deserved to be shocked. 6. Some subjects said they believed all along that the experiment was wrong and this belief somehow served to satisfy them that ultimately they were right-minded about the whole thing. They didn't see that thought not they didn't see that thought not translated into action was useless as a moral safeguard. Oh. Then, shall I finish? No. We'll stop here. Alright. Till a few minutes from now. I'm going to get a couple of these in today. Bye-bye. I said.